of my life because I got my driver's license. And I lived in the US at the time. And it's not like in Australia where you've got to have these L plates and P plates and all of these restrictions. Where I lived, you went into the Department of Motor Vehicles, you filled out a form, they took a picture, then you drove a car around the block one time to make sure you know how to use the gas pedal and brake pedal, and you pulled back in and they gave you a driver's license and said, God bless you, have a nice day. Next, right? that was the experience. And I walk into the sunlight thinking, this is amazing, I'm free. I'm just like getting out of prison, right? Yesterday, my parents had to take me to the mall, had to drive me around, etc. Now I can drive myself. But of course, you need a car for that whole thing to work, or otherwise you're just at the bus stop with a driver's license in your pocket. Not cool. So every kid turning 16 wants a car, because a car represents freedom, where I live in the United States. And maybe the only difference between me and the other kids was I was slightly more ambitious than the other kids. So this is actually a picture of the kind of car I want. It's, uh, it, it, for those of you that aren't fluent in cars, it's a Chevrolet Corvette. This is what it looked like when I was 16 years old, and I fell in love with this car. In fact, it became my goal. I fell in love with this car to such a degree where I just came to the conclusion that life is not worth living unless you drive a car like that. And what's the point? You get up in the morning, you put on clothes, you tie your shoelaces, and you go and do stuff. There's no point in it unless you can drive a car like that. Right? So I became obsessed with this car. I began drawing it. I began going to the dealership every weekend and sitting in the car. All the salespeople knew me as that crazy kid that comes on weekends and sits in a Corvette. And I remember one time I went to the dealership and the sales guy says, look, man, I know you come here every weekend and sit in the Corvettes and you think we don't see you, but we do. And we kind of feel sorry for you. And, even thought about putting a charity fund together for you, but no, <laughs> since you're here, I'm going to lunch in a few minutes, and I'm going to drive that Corvette. Do you want to come with me? You won't be able to drive it. And it was the first time I sat in a Corvette when it was on, and I heard the exhaust, how, how the seats wrap around your lumbar, and when you hit the gas, the roar of the engine, the it was just incredible. And at that point, I realized I would rather die than not have that car. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking at, at, at that point, right? What can a kid at the age of 16 do to achieve that type of car? Because by the way, I wanted that car while I was still in high school, right? When it was, when it's cars still mean something. I don't want that car when I'm 80, when I can't hear the exhaust. Or, you know, right, I won't make any more jokes on that, but I wanted it now. So this is the equivalent of some 16 year old in Australia saying, look, in three years time, I want to have a Ferrari from my own effort, from my own work. That's the mindset that I was in. And my parents raised me to believe that I could achieve anything, right? Your parents are always saying I could achieve anything. This is what I want, right? This is belief. So I began thinking about how could I get a Corvette? And because I wanted it so much, my desire for it was so high, I thought about it all the time, like being in love. I was in love with that car. So I took my first step. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, I did not steal a Corvette. <laughs> I went and got a job, my first job ever, at Target stores, and this is the actual name tag that I had. And I earned $4.25 an hour, which was minimum wage in the United States when I was 16. They could not pay me less, legally, than that amount. And I remember being over the moon because I'd taken the first step to the car, taken the first move towards making this a reality, and I was so happy until I did the math, because there's only 2,000 working hours in the year, more or less, and I couldn't work all of those because I'm in school, and multiply times $4.25 an hour, minus all of the taxes you have to pay, I figured out that after about 60 years, I could afford the insurance on the Corvette, right? So it was, it's a significant blow, it was a set, mental setback, I have to admit. But it didn't get me down. I'd made the next step. What was my next step? I moved to McDonald's. McDonald's paid me $5 an hour. You know how happy I was? When was the last time you got almost a 20% rise in pay with no additional qualifications or experience, right? Even changing industries to do a job you've never done before in your life. It was fantastic until I did the math again. And it was like 59 years until I could get the insurance. So I kept stepping until I finally ended up at a car wash and I was making $10, $11 an hour. And the problem with the car wash is you make the most amount of money in tips in the coldest days of the year. You know why? Because that husband that opens the window when that chill comes in, he doesn't say to the wife, 
I'll wash the car today. He says to the wife, honey, it's too damn cold to wash the car. Let's take it to the car wash. And then there's a sucker like me sitting there in minus two degree weather. The car comes out of the car wash wet, and I'm standing there with two towels. And you've got to stand like this to make sure not much body heat escapes, right? Because if you stand like this, you'll freeze to death. So you're standing close together, and your job is to dry down the car. Then you've got to vacuum it, clean the windows on the inside. If there's any additional dirt or requirements, like putting the shine in the tires, you've got to do that. And I remember working at that car wash with a pink nose, steam coming out of my nose. And I would hate those people that had put those fancy wheels on their car. You know, BBS wheels, you know, with all those spokes. God, I hated those people. I hope none of you have those wheels on your car. Because in minus two, two degree weather, you've got to take a towel and put it in every one of those nooks and crannies. And with my numb pink fingers, I would jam it in there. Hated those wheels. And I really resented people to this day that had BBS rooms in the car. So at some point, after about two years, I'm almost 18. I reach a point where I begin to doubt that I can get the car, right? And the moment you stop believing, it's the end of the journey. It's you, you're defeated at that point, it's there because you stop trying. And at my lowest point, after uh, one day of work, I went to the gym, I lifted weights every day, and this car was parked outside. Now, I knew everyone at the gym, I'd been working out there for two years since I got my driver's license, it wasn't the owner's car, I drove a Porsche, it was somebody else. And I quickly wanted to find out whose car that is. There's someone in this gym that's doing something different. I want to find out what they're doing, I want to learn. So I walk into the gym and I'm looking around for any new faces and I'm asking people, you know, hey, that car outside. Showing me the different parts of the gym, and I do a little, you know, like CIA surveillance. <laughs> I finally find this guy in the corner, huge, huge, a head taller than me. His name is Pete Moorcroft, curling these massive dumbbells, and I find out it's his car. And I observe him for a week, and I find out, this was critical by the way, that he trains his chest and back on Mondays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> You laugh, that was critical intelligence back then, right? <laughs> because then I could train my chest and back on Mondays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. to be in the same part of the gym as him. And after a few more weeks of being in the same part of the gym as he is, I finally struck up the conversations, and about a week later, I finally threw myself at his mercy, and it happened in front of a dumbbell rack that looked like this. He was there, head tall, a cannonball shoulders, curling veins popping out on his shoulders and arms, and I'm standing next to him, you know, with dumbbells that might have been one-tenth of what he was using. <laughs> Getting ready for the big moment, like asking a girl out on a date, but this was worse, right? This is asking someone for some career advice, except you don't have a career. And I put the dumbbells down, I turned to him and I said, Pete, I, I, I'm nobody. I, I don't have any work experience, I don't, I'm, not, I'm still a kid in high school, but I know one thing, I want to be successful. Can you just tell me what I need to do to be a quarter as successful with you, a tenth as successful with you? And I remember him, he stopped curling, he put those dumbbells, dumbbells were so heavy, he had to you know, hold, hold them on his thigh to put them back in the rack. He wipes the sweat from his brow. He turns and looks at me, the shadow like falls, right? All the, blocks out all the light in the gym. I look up, and this was the, probably the most important moment of my life at that point because I thought he was going to tell me the secret to success, the meaning of life, why mankind was formed and why we're here and we we're going to go after death. It was all going to be explained to me in this moment in time. Instead, he asks me a question like this. He said, Matt, if you wanted to become the CEO of Walt Disney, company, what would you do? That was a crushing disappointment, because I, I want an answer, not a question. I don't even know what CEO means, but <laughs> apparently it was some important role. So I said to Pete, look, I've got no idea, but you know, would I have to get a job in the mail room of Walt Disney Company and work my way up over 100 years until I got to the, I, I, I don't know. And then he said, that's, that's exactly your problem. You don't know how to achieve the goal. He said, if you want to become the CEO of Walt Disney, the first thing you should do after graduating from high school is go to the university, study business, make top grades, 
and enter the management consulting or investment banking industry. And there are reasons why he said that. And then work for three to five years, get an MBA, work your ass off getting an MBA and try to be in the best school, top of your class. And when you graduate, there's only one company that I want you to apply for a job at. One company. And I said, Walt Disney? I said, well, not Walt Disney, General Electric. And I said, General Electric, do they make movies as well? He said, he said, no, they don't make movies, but they've got the best management training program in the world. And if you go through this path, you'll get into GE's management training program and you'll be mentored by executives, you'll be put into different divisions, different geographies. They will mentor you to be the best you can be. And when Jack Welch, the CEO at the time, retires, the next CEO will come from the best of the best of the management training program. And I said, Pete, I think we're talking about Walt Disney, not GE. And he says, we are, because you're not going to be the next CEO of GE. So when they get the new CEO, the other people that are in this management training program quit, and they become CEOs of other Fortune 500 companies like Walt Disney, and that's what you're going to do. And then, it, then he said, quarter or some huge amount of Fortune 500 CEOs at some point went through a process similar to this. And what that made me realize was that people don't achieve their goals because they don't know how. You can have the best goal in the world. I want to be a millionaire in 12 months. I want to have a business. I want to be do this. Great. And you believe you're capable of achieving it. Because why not? Other people with less advantages, less skills, less intelligence achieve that goal. So why not you? And you want it really, really bad. You wake up every day on fire to achieve that goal. And yet it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen for a simple reason. You've got no idea what you should do next. What's my next move? What's my next step? The tragedy of all of this is that people don't invest in the knowledge because they believe education is expensive. I've got to take time off from work, I've got to go and invest in this program, I've got to buy this material and so on. And my message to you today is that education isn't expensive. The most expensive thing in the world is actually ignorance. The amount of money and forfeited opportunities that ignorance will cost you in your life is unfathomable, right? If you compare all of the lost opportunities, all the lost income, all of the things you could have achieved, if you only knew how to achieve them, versus the cost of getting educated on how to achieve them, you'll see that it's a thousand to one, ten thousand to one ratio. So what do successful people do? They invest in knowledge. They have a goal, they start moving, whether it's learning a magic trick, getting a car, building a business, they start moving. And then they find they don't know what the next step is, so they get educated. Right? And the last thing that they do is that they take action. They don't talk about losing weight, becoming successful, becoming the best at something. They actually act. Because the only thing that will generate results in your life is you actually doing something. You can, you can sit at a thousand seminars like this and nothing will ever change unless you actually act on what you're listening. It's like fitness. You're not going to get fit by reading a fitness book. You're going to get fit, well, it depends what kind of book, but... The, <laughs> there's another joke that came to mind, but I'll leave that for, for another audience. What are you thinking? Well, hold on a second. <laughs> The point is that you've got to read a fitness book and you've got to go to the gym. You've got to change your diet. You're not going to get wealthy by reading investment magazines. You've got to learn and act. Save more. Start a business. Invest in real estate. Action drives results. The reason that people don't act is they don't have a goal. If you're not looking for something, very difficult to direct your actions in any particular direction. If you don't have belief or desire, you won't take action. You won't put effort into it. You won't take the first step. And if you don't know how to do it, you won't know what the first step is, right? So one framework for making action easier, which is scientifically proven, is to unpack your goals into mini goals or milestones. So whatever your goal is, what are the milestones you need to achieve to make your overall goal a reality? Just like with the CEO of Walt Disney. That's a big, huge, multi-decade goal that has to be broken down into steps. 
Whatever your goal is, a career position, a business, being financially independent, it's typically a large goal that won't happen in a single step. So what are all of the miniature steps that you have to take to reach the overall goal? Science proves that if you break goals down like this, you're far more likely to achieve them because the process becomes more manageable. You know this little thing has to happen first, then this thing, rather than some gargantuan step that looks like it's miles into the future. So let me go back to the real story here, which is the car. This whole talk is nothing but fill up for the real story, which is how I got to the Corvette. So I realized after Pete gave me this lecture on knowledge and how goals are attained, that I wasn't going to reach the car by having, being an employee. No one is going to pay me enough at the age of 18 to go and buy that car within a reasonable period of time. So I realized at that point, to get the Corvette, I needed a business that had recurring revenue, a successful business, something that generated revenue and profits. So that began me putting me on a completely different trajectory than looking for higher paying employment. And on this new trajectory, I began thinking, what kind of business could I have? Right? I don't know anything. I'm still a student in high school. What could I possibly do? And I think about what do I enjoy? What are the things that I know something about? And I got to fitness. I go to the gym. I train. I know a lot about nutrition. What could I do with that? And I began thinking, what are those people that get paid to train other people? What are those people called? Personal trainers. How much do personal trainers make? Wow, they make a lot more than people at a car wash. And what if I had a few personal trainers working for me? How would that all work out? So, I took personal training courses. I got accredited. I studied business when I went to college. I set up a company. And by the way, you can tell that I'm not a marketing major because I drew that business card. It's the first business card I ever had in my life that was my own company, Fitness Forever. So. <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool at the time. Hey, and by the way, just a marketing tip. You know where the name comes from? Um, around this time, I was at the theater, at the movies, and Batman Forever was out. <laughs> <laughs> Need a name for a business, a good name. Batman Forever, Batman Forever. There you go. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I had a gym partnership. I had customers. Then I hired other trainers. The business started generating recurring revenue all within a 12, 15 month period. And at 19, I had the car. In fact, the picture was of Ohio. I, I, I don't tell you that story to impress you because it's, it, a car is a childish, you know, materialistic style story. I, I use that particular story because I had no advantages in my life at that point, right? My parents were academics. They immigrated from communistic Poland without a cent. They had no money, no business acumen, no connections to the business community. No one took me under their wing and said, Matt, let me teach you about business. Let me teach you about how to be an entrepreneur. Let me do I had no advantages of any kind. No one gave me money, knowledge, or anything. And any kid that I went to high school with could have done what I did, become a personal trainer. I didn't invent anything. I didn't write some piece of technology that made me work. It was very simplistic. What I was intuitively doing is following these steps. Even the step of changing your environment. I was over here at the gym with a lot of people that were just average people. And I was spending time with them. And then you know what I did? I went over here and there was this guy, Pete Moorcroft. And he was very unlike those people from a financial and success state. And I began spending time with him and he became my first mentor. He said, Let, and then he introduced me to his friends, which were nothing like those people's friends, right? So by changing my environment, that simple thing, it changed my life and, and, and the belief that I had about the things that I could achieve. So I want to leave you with one last message today, right? Any one of you can do the things. I did it at an early age. You can do it today. Set a goal. Uh, surround yourself by people that have achieved that type of goal or read books. Make sure you want it. You've got to want it. Educate yourself on what it takes to achieve it and take regular action. And my bonus tip for you comes from no other than my uncle. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> He's my great uncle. No, I'm kidding about that. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger for the following reason. When I was in a fraternity in college, I made a pledge that I would never give a keynote without at least mentioning Arnold Schwarzenegger once. So I've worked him in and I'm very happy and made good on my pledge. 
And my bonus tip to you for high achievers, those of you that want to achieve the maximum in your business, in your life, in your careers, is the following. When Schwarzenegger was competing, his weakest body part were his calves. And he trained with a bodybuilder and watched who had much bigger calves than he did and watched him train his legs. And that bodybuilder did calves twice or three times as much as Arnold did. That bodybuilder was using five, six hundred pounds for 10, 12 sets every day on the calf raises. Arnold looked at that and said, I'm not doing anything near what this guy is doing. So he went back to Venice Beach and again, multiple choice. What do you think Arnold did? A, he said to himself, shit, I'm not doing that, man. That looks hard. <laughs> B, he said, I'm going to do exactly what that bodybuilder did. Or C, I'm going to do twice as much. Because I don't want to be just as good as him, I want to be the best. And Arnold Schwarzenegger did see, and there were pictures of him doing calf raises with a thousand pounds at Venice Beach. People standing on the machine, and he did it for 20 sets, six days a week, to build up his calves. Because he didn't want to be just like any other bodybuilder, he wanted to be the best. Yeah? So whenever you're faced with an opportunity, you hear from someone how they achieve success, you've got the same choice. Shit, I'm not doing that. That's hard. Right? That's your first choice. Do nothing. Second choice, I'll do exactly what that guy or girl did. That's your second choice. Or your third choice is, you'll have it. You'll do twice as much, right? Because you want to reach your maximum potential. The last thing I want you to do, which will take 10 seconds, I want everyone to take a picture of this slide. It's not going to work unless everyone does it. So I can share my final key message with you. Please just take out your phone.